Toshihiro Hirano isn't the most well-known figure in the anime industry, but his animation directing and art style had a huge impact on the medium, essentially defining the look and tone of late 80s anime. Hirano made a name for himself animating powerful mechs and beautiful women on projects like Megazone 2-3, Fight Ixer 1, Magic Knight Ray Earth, and many other staple series from the 80s and 90s. And although he still works in the anime industry to this day, having recently directed the Netflix adaptations of Baki the Grappler, it was in the 1980s where we'd see Hirano's greatest contributions to anime, and where his art style would truly flourish without compromise. Toshihiro Hirano was born in Tokyo on October 3rd, 1956. He grew up in Shinjuku, and according to Hirano, the urban environment influenced the stories he wanted to tell. Hirano's favorite manga were works like Tetsujin 28, Iga no Kagemaru, and Space Boy Soren. Noting that Tezuka works like Astro Boy didn't really interest him. Hirano said he never viewed anime as anything more than an extension of manga. Every week, he'd read the latest chapter of Adventure on Gabuton Island without fail, but called the anime adaptation of the series an inferior product, and often complained about the anime's quality. But this changed when he saw the revolutionary Toei film The Little Prince and the Eight-Headed Dragon. It was only after seeing this film that Hirano understood the appeal of anime, but there was another form of media that left a stronger and more lasting impact on him. Monster movies. The first of these films Hirano saw was the 1962 film Gorath, directed by Godzilla director Ishiro Honda. Surprisingly, Hirano wouldn't see the original Godzilla until years later, with the first films in the franchise he saw being the goofier entries like King Kong vs. Godzilla. Four years after the release of Gorath and King Kong vs. Godzilla, monster movies made their move to the small screen with Ultra Q. The series was, in the most literal sense, a Monster of the Week anthology show created by Eiji Tsuburaya. Tsuburaya did the special effects for many of Toho's monster movies, including the original Godzilla, and by the mid-60s, he had a very high standing within the company. Because of his outstanding reputation, Toho allowed him to use props, including monster costumes, for production of his own TV show. As a result, Ultra Q featured giant monsters portrayed in a way never before seen on home televisions. Hirano only became more infatuated with the genre when later that year, Tsuburaya released the successor to Ultra Q, Ultraman. Ultraman was still a Monster of the Week show, but unlike Ultra Q, which had more in common with series like The Twilight Zone and The Outer Limits, Ultraman was a superhero show. Every episode had Shin Hayata transform into the titular Ultraman, growing huge to fight giant monsters and space aliens in a massive special effects heavy wrestling match. Unlike Ultra Q, Ultraman aired in color, but since Hirano didn't have a color TV, he would often watch it with his friends in their school cafeteria. A year later, the next Ultra series aired, Ultra 7. Hirano was 11 when Ultra 7 premiered, and by this time, many of his friends had moved on from Ultraman and monster movies, but not Hirano. In 6th grade, Hirano bought a copy of Shotaro Ishinomori's book Manga 101, which taught him how to draw with a pen instead of a pencil. Hirano said that most young artists from that time learned to draw from that book, and the new skills he learned inspired him to make his own manga, though he never finished any of the stories he started. Not long after the premiere of Ultra 7, Hirano entered junior high, and like many of his friends, was beginning to lose interest in anime and monster movies. During this time, Hirano only drew casually and spent most of his time running in his school's track and field club since his junior high didn't have an art club. Hirano continued to drift from anime and Japanese tokusatsu works, shifting his interest to American films. Hirano said there was a period where Japanese entertainment just wasn't satisfying, and during that time, overseas films filled the void. This sentiment would change while Hirano was in high school. In 1971, Japanese TV saw a special effects boom with the release of Toei's Kamen Rider and Tsuburaya's Return of Ultraman. A year later, anime would have a huge comeback too with the release of Mazinger Z. Mazinger Z was about a boy named Koji Kabuto who piloted a giant robot to fight against evil robots known as Mechanical Beasts. The series borrowed heavily from the monster movies of Hirano's childhood, but utilized the medium of animation to portray what couldn't be shown as easily in live action. Hirano fell in love with Kamen Rider and Mazinger Z, even enduring shame by going to the Mazinger theatrical film at the Toei Manga Festival. Enduring shame because the average attendee was about eight years old. As Hirano prepared to graduate high school, he knew he wanted a career in illustration, but was reluctant to set his sights on anime. Hirano graduated high school still mostly enjoying American films, and although he enrolled in graphic design school, he still had no interest in working in animation. He enrolled in courses dedicated to learning painting and printing at Tokyo designer Gakuen College. After a year though, Hirano entered the manga department and befriended a group of other students, including Seno Knife, 
Kanira Masumi, and Hurricane Ryu. These men would all enter the manga industry and were all anime and tokusatsu enthusiasts, reinvigorating Hirano's interest in the mediums. While still studying at his school's manga department, Hirano took a tour of Toei Doga. The HR person there introduced him to Toei's Studio No. 1, where Hirano would accept a job as a part-timer. Hirano had never heard of the studio before, but he knew that Takua Noda, the animation director of Getter Robo and Gai King, was working there, and that alone was enough for him to accept the position. Alongside Takua Noda, Hirano was also working alongside Osamu Nabushima and Yoshinori Kanada. Kanada was one of Japan's most influential animators because of his very specific style of character animation, utilizing limited animation to show characters performing striking action. According to Hayao Miyazaki, what made Kanida's animation so powerful was that he understood physics and would incorporate weight and momentum into his movement. Kanida's style of quick and flashy action animation would go on to inspire many animators, one of the most notable being Hiroyuki Imaishi, the founder of Studio Trigger, who essentially built his animation career off the groundwork laid by Kanida. Hirano started his career with Studio No. 1 doing in-betweens on Kaneda's work on Gai King. According to Hirano, anime in those days used less pictures, so in-betweens were much more important. And he credits doing in-betweens on Kaneda's animation for greatly improving his own art. Though he initially only joined to get some experience and make some money, Hirano became fascinated with the process and decided to stay on, working on robot shows like UFO Robot Grandizer and Dangard Ace. Hirano graduated from Tokyo Designer Gaku in College in 1978, and immediately after graduating became a full-time employee at Toei. To Hirano's shock, his first assignment after joining full-time was for the historical anime Ikiyu-san. Ikiyu-san was an anime that told the life story of the titular Buddhist monk. The anime started in 1975, but ran until 1982, with a total of 296 episodes. Ikiyu-san was totally different from the giant robot shows Hirano was used to, and the shift to a genre Hirano wasn't interested in made the job unbearable. Hirano called the 7-9 to nine months he spent working on the show a total nightmare, and only refused to quit because of the reputation and legacy of Studio No. 1. Hirano did get some relief though, as while he was working on Ikiyu-san, he was commissioned to do art for the magazine Televikun, where he made some extra money by drawing art of giant robots and tokusatsu heroes. Salvation came to Hirano in the form of an offer by Takuo Noda. Noda was working on the character designs for an anime called Arrow Emblem, Hawk of the Grand Prix, and offered Hirano a job as a key animator. Hirano was specifically a secondary key animator and was only allowed to draw cars, but the work exalted him of the pain from working on Ikiyu-san. Hawk was directed by Rintaro, who'd later become renowned for his work on projects like The Dagger of Kamui and Galaxy Express 39. But Hawk wasn't very popular, and Rintaro would leave after directing 24 of 44 episodes. After Hawk, Rintaro would move on to directing Space Pirate Captain Harlock, which Toei's Studio No. 1 would also participate in. Hirano did second key animation for two episodes directed by Noda. Hirano joked in interviews that you'll notice that the women in those episodes are especially beautiful, and interestingly enough, Hirano's episodes tended to revolve around particularly beautiful women. Episode 11, Lola Shines Golden, is about a beautiful Mazone alien named Lola, who distracts Tadashi Daiba with her beauty before hypnotizing him with her psychic powers. Episode 17, The Skeleton Hero, was about the Arcadia's chief engineer, who married a beautiful woman only for his former captain to kill her, revealing her as a Mazone. He also did some work on episode 19, but in a lesser capacity, which means he narrowly avoided working on episode 18, arguably the worst episode of the series, the Green Baby Planet episode. I don't think anyone gave a shit when they were making this episode, it's supposed to be a continuation of episode 17, but the chief engineer's daughter Midori doesn't have green hair anymore, which I don't know how that happened because Midori means green. Then again, the show also has a character named Emeraldus, she's red. After working on three episodes of Harlock, Hirano was taken from Studio No. 1 to work on Farewell to Space Battleship Yamato, Warriors of Love, where he worked on the film as an in-between checker. Hirano said in-between checker was a misnomer, and that his actual job on Yamato was taking entire scenes and fixing the animation they got back from South Korea, which sometimes involved completely reanimating them. Hirano worked side by side with Tomonori Kogawa, who he'd strike up a friendship with while working on the Yamato film. Kogawa had been working for both Toei and Tatsunoko, but had been planning to start his own studio around this time. The workload for the Yamato film was tremendous, but Hirano had enjoyed Yamato as a teenager, and wound up becoming close friends with Kogawa over the course of the film's production. After Farewell to Yamato was completed, Hirano went back to Studio No. 1 and worked on Captain Future. Around this time, Kogawa became more and more tempted to form his own studio, eventually founding Studio Bebo in 1979. Hirano worked part-time for Kogawa, who was mostly doing subcontracting work for Studio Sunrise, animating on shows like The Ultraman, Mobile Suit Gundam, and Daitarn 3. At the same time, still working with Toei Studio No. 1 on the key animation for Captain Future. Toei found out Hirano was doing work outside of the company, and to avoid arguing about industry politics, he would wind up leaving Toei to join Kogawa's studio full-time. 
When Hirano first arrived at Studio Bebo, he was surprised to find out that he and Kogawa were the only members. Hirano spent his early days at Bebo animating the Ultraman, as well as the pilot film Space Carrier Blue Noah, though Hirano wasn't fond of either series. After that, Hirano worked on the Flower Child Loon Loon. Hirano said he worked tirelessly to portray Shingo Araki's character designs, and was frustrated when he saw the animation director had completely redrawn his work. Hirano's next project was Gachaman Fighter, where Kogawa served as animation director. But there was a problem. Hirano couldn't draw Tatsunoko characters, and as a result he was relegated to only drawing the Iron Beast, the giant robot monsters of the series. In his youth, Hirano only drew men and robots, but as he grew older, he became more and more interested in drawing cute girls, to the point that it was almost impossible for him to draw manly men. Wait, what do you mean you spent all your money on retro gaming magazines and cursed VHS tapes? Well, as you know, I enjoy researching retro gaming and lost media, and the best way to get more information on these subjects is by importing books, magazines, and tapes from Japan. Problem is, the proxy site I was using to avoid massive shipping fees and scalpers required me to deposit money into my account with them. This made it so after every purchase, there was a little money left over. So I naturally kept adding a little bit more into my account, and uh, now I'm broke. Broke? You could have just used Baiyi and avoided this altogether. Heck, Baiyi gives you free money just for signing up. They what? God damn it! No, we'll never get that VHS copy of Saki Sanobashi. God damn it! I'm sorry you had to see me like this. If only I had seen a YouTube description link telling me to use Baiyi instead of other proxy services. I wouldn't have fallen for their predatory tricks, and I would have gotten 2,000 yen off my first purchase, roughly 17 US dollars. Baiyi is basically the site to go to if you're looking to buy anything from Japan. I used to use eBay to get a lot of books and materials for my videos, but they were all insanely marked up. By using Baiyi, you can basically go to Amazon Japan, Yahoo Japan Shopping, or Yahoo Japan Auction and buy anything in Japan you're looking for. What Baiyi does is they buy the product for you, ship it to their warehouse, and then ship it to you internationally. This has saved me a ton of money buying books for videos, but if you're interested in video games or even researching lost media, I would definitely check out Yahoo Japan Auctions because you can find some crazy VHS tapes on there. Bebo's next project was Space Runaway Ideon. Ideon was a huge investment for Studio Sunrise, with the project being helmed by Mobile Suit Gundam creator Yoshiyuki Tomino. Tominori Kogawa was chosen as the main character designer, and Ideon would require the participation of all of Bebo's staff. Ichiro Itano, an animator who had previously worked on Mobile Suit Gundam, joined Bebo, and Hirano fell in love with his animation. Hirano was amazed at Itano's work on the scene where the Ideon first stood up. His unique depiction of Mecha was outstanding, even then, and I was very conscious of him as a rival who I could draw on equal terms with. At the same time, Sunrise issued a variety of complaints towards Bebo's work on Ideon. The series was doing poorly ratings-wise, with the main complaints being Kogawa's character designs and Ideon being too different from other mecha anime, as the series had a storyline that was darker and more tragic than even that of Mobile Suit Gundam. Following Ideon's cancellation, most of Bebo's staff shifted focus to the theatrical version of Ideon, while Hirano worked as an animation director on Dr. Slump. Hirano was a huge fan of the Dr. Slump manga and prided himself on his ability to draw an Arale chan that looked exactly like Akira Toriyama's manga design. Hirano left Bebo and founded his own studio, Studio EO, bringing a woman named Narumi Kakinoichi with him. It's unclear exactly when it happened, but we do know that sometime in the early 80s, Hirano and Kakinoichi were married, and she would follow him as the hectic industry moved him from studio to studio. At Hirano's Studio EO, Hirano continued to work on Dr. Slump while also working on Fang of the Sun Dagram and Arusa Yatsura. Hirano was excited at his opportunity to animate for Arusei Yatsura, but was disappointed that he was never offered episodes storyboarded by Mamoru Oshii. Around this time, Ichiro Itano would also leave Studio Bebo to join Studio Artland, where he'd begin working on the film adaptation of Crusher Joe. It was while working on Crusher Joe that he met and befriended Shoji Kawamori of Studio Nue. Kawamori had been working on a proposal for a new anime based around a transforming mech, and Itano would reach out to Hirano about working on the project. Hirano said he didn't care for the character designs, but he liked the transforming mech concept enough that he accepted a role as an animator. The project was the Super Dimension Fortress Macross, which was planned to have animation production split between Tatsunoko and Studio Artland. The work needed to produce Macross was intense, and Hirano would need to shut down Studio EO and join the staff at Artland full-time to complete his assignments. Ideas and budgets changed rapidly, and the workload was so large that a handful of episodes had to be sent overseas to be animated in Korea. The studio handling these episodes was called Star Pro, and their output was nothing short of embarrassing. Receiving poor animation from overseas wasn't uncommon. In fact, Hirano's job on Yamato was just 
just that, correcting bad animation. Except there was a problem. Because of the show's detailed mech designs, the animation was labor-intensive, and it was often too much for the staff to correct in time for the show to air. It didn't help things when the show that was supposed to air in the time slot after Macross, Warrior of Love Rainbow Man, was having its own production issues and had its premiere delayed by one week. As a result, the TV network MBS decided to premiere the first two episodes of Macross on the same week, meaning that episode production had to be pushed up by one week, putting an even greater strain on the staff. This also raised issues because Episode 2 was animated by StarPro, and since Episode 2 was going to be aired on the first week, they didn't want people's introduction to the series to be poorly animated. And so Episode 2 was entirely reanimated in-house by Studio Artland, but this also led to production of episodes being pushed back even further. Episodes generally weren't being finished until the day before they aired, until Episode 11, where the episode wasn't finished in time and what aired was an incomplete episode composed mostly of keyframes. Despite these issues though, the show did incredibly well and the toys were very popular. So popular that MBS ordered 13 more episodes, increasing the intended run from 23 episodes to 36 episodes. It was a difficult job, but the show was a hit. Regardless, Hirano was dissatisfied with the final project due to the poor quality of animation that can be seen in the final version. After Macross, Hirano went back to working on Arusei Atsura, where he acted as an animation director on episode 90. But luckily for him, this was an episode storyboarded by Oshi. Meanwhile, Hirano's college friends Hurricane Ryu and Seno Knife had begun publishing manga in the hentai magazine Lemon People, and it was announced in early 1983 that Hirano and Ichiro Itano would be adapting one of Hurricane Ryu's manga for television. The manga was Gekisatsu Uchuken, or Space Punch, and almost as quickly as it was announced, the project was cancelled, with Itano and Hirano moving their focus on production of the Macross theatrical film. Macross Theatrical Edition, later titled Macross Do You Remember Love, entered production shortly following the finale of the Macross TV series in 1983, and many on the staff saw the film as an opportunity to make amends to fans for the quality issues seen on the TV version. Hirano was in charge of all of the animation involving the Zentradi aliens, and working on the film helped him recover from his dissatisfaction with the Macross TV series. Do You Remember Love was a massive box office success, and following its premiere, Hirano was offered a job on the production of an original anime TV series, Omega City 2-3. Omega City 2-3 was proposed by Design Studio Artmic, with Noburo Ishiguro contracted to direct, and his studio Artland to handle animation with assistance from AIC. Hirano was offered the role of character designer, with Artland's connections to the Macross series being heavily marketed to attract sponsors. Unfortunately, the project failed to obtain a toy sponsor and didn't receive a television time slot. As a result, the planned series was reduced to a single straight-to-video anime film. According to Hirano, the production was a mess, with the film essentially being hobbled together as they were told to make changes both due to time and budget constraints, as well as to appease their investors. This may also be why the film has a notorious amount of product placement. The film was released in theaters and on video in March of 1985, and despite numerous plot holes and inconsistencies, the video was a surprise hit. For context, some plot holes worth mentioning are when it's revealed the entire city and all the main characters are actually living on a spaceship, but when someone says they have friends that have traveled overseas, it's explained that when you go to an airport, you're hypnotized and made to think you traveled overseas. This contrivance occurred because the original script didn't include the part about the city being in a spaceship, but this was added later to market the series as being similar to Macross. In fact, the original planning document for Omega City 2-3 says they wanted the majority of the series set on Earth specifically to set it apart from other mecha shows. Hirano said his head was spinning all the way through to the end of production of the film, and the characters on screen felt very different than the characters he envisioned, noting that his designs were very inconsistent, with some characters looking like they were from a completely different show. Despite these issues, the film was a massive financial success with memorable characters and genuinely impressive animation. The film did so well, a second film was rushed into production. Hirano was once again offered the role of character designer, and Noboru Ishiguro was asked to return to direct, though neither would reprise their roles, most likely due to the stress caused by working on the first film. Because of Megazone's success on video, AIC and many other animation studios were rushing to produce the next big straight-to-video anime, and Hirano wasted no time choosing his next project. Although we'd never see an animated version of Space Punch, Hirano eventually would adapt a different manga from Lemon People, Aron Ray's Ixer 1. As an OVA, Ixer 1 was an amalgamation of Hirano's interest with cute girls, giant robots, and tons of anime and tokusatsu references. 
The soundtrack was done by Chume Watanabe, who Hirano had personally requested because of his experience creating tokusatsu soundtracks for series like Android Kakaider, Go Ranger, and not to mention Hirano's greatest inspiration, Mazinger Z. While Megazone set a precedent that there was a market for adult-oriented animation, the movie itself wasn't far off tone from a TV anime. There is a sex scene, but it was relatively tasteful and made sense within the context of the film. Ixer 1, on the other hand, went full-on exploitation, opening up with a lesbian sex scene, despite one of these characters actually being male in the original manga, violence that is completely over the top with bodies morphing into horrible Lovecraftian monsters, dream sequences inspired by the Nightmare on Elm Street series, with the dread of George Romero zombie films, franchises both Aran Rei and Toshiro Hirano were huge fans of. The monsters in the OVA were designed by Junichi Watanabe, whom Hirano knew as an animator from his days at Studio Bebo but he would later earn a claim for his monster designs on the 1986 OVA Call Me Tonight. Originally, Ixer 1 was planned as an hour and a half long film similar to Megazone, but Hirano's lack of faith in the project led him to reducing the runtime to 30 minutes. I didn't think it would sell that well, so I gave myself 30 minutes to hit it and quit it. Ixer 1 released in 1985, and like Megazone, it was a surprise hit. Also like Megazone, AIC wasted no time greenlighting a sequel OVA, but before that, Following the release of Ixer 1, Hirano was contacted by Studio Piero and was asked to do character designs for an upcoming mecha anime, Ninja Warrior Tobikage. Shigeru Kato was already hired as character designer at the time, however Kato would be designing the male characters, while Hirano, who was known for drawing beautiful women, would design the female characters to make the show seem more marketable. Hirano was excited to work on a robot show, but unhappy to return to television, where he once again was forced to make changes based on orders from the higher-ups. One of these changes was with the character Renny Ai, who was supposed to be wearing an aerobics leotard with a shirt over it, similar to Yui's outfit in Megazone. But Hirano was told that it had to be changed because they weren't allowed to show underwear. Hirano tried to explain that it wasn't underwear, it was a leotard, but he was completely ignored, and they had to lengthen the character's shirt, turning it into a dress, despite the leotard still being visible underneath. Hirano said he probably wouldn't have been able to get through the series if he hadn't been riding off the high of working on Ixer 1. Toby Kage was not a very popular show and didn't do very well, and is now best known for its bizarre localization Ninja Robots, featuring some of the strangest dialogue and voice acting I've ever heard. Damien! Yeah? It's past midnight, man! Um, would you believe I was looking for change in the seats? They don't make coins anymore, what are you really doing? I was just trying to drive it, I, don't, I can't make it do anything. Colonel, your wife is on the phone. Joe! Joe, answer me! Answer me, Joe! Jenny, you have to take your finger off the button or he can't answer back. Please don't move. If you move, this woman will perish. If I convince the Lunar Guards, we could have the possibility to enter. Don't you think so? Major Gordon, I... Let me return the favor. You saved my life, remember? Well, the more the merrier. It'll all be good. It's about... Mike. Did I ever tell you that Mom said she found you in a garbage can? Tobikage would be the last TV series Hirano would work on for a good while, but he did work on a few other projects while continuing his work on Ixer 1 Act 2. In December of 1985, Hirano and his wife would co-direct Ikenai Mako-chan, Mako's Sexy Symphony, the seventh episode in the Cream Lemon Hentai series, which actually has an homage to the sex scene from Megazone. Not much is really known about the production of Cream Lemon. Hirano did do two interviews in Lemon People magazine, however he almost exclusively talks about Ixer 1 in these interviews. In 1986, Hirano designed the main character Michi for the OVA Cosmos Pink Shock. Cosmos Pink Shock was a 36-minute gag animation written by future Pokemon writer Takeshi Shudo, and featuring what is said to be the first anime credit of Ghost in the Shell composer Kenji Kawai. Despite the names attached, the video didn't sell well, and Hirano received negative feedback on his character design, but he defended the design and said people only hated it because it was different from his other work. Despite Pink Shock failing, Hirano wouldn't focus on it much, as two days after the video hit store shelves, we'd see the release of Fight Ixer 1 Act 2. By the end of Act 1, the entirety of Aran Rei's Ixer 1 manga had been adapted, so Hirano created the rest of the story on his own, including his own mythology surrounding the Kuthawolf aliens. Act 2 would introduce Ixer 2, the evil sister of Ixer 1, inspired by Android Kakaider's evil brother, Hakaider. There were noticeable changes in the designs between Act 1 and 2, with the biggest being mech designer Masami Obari joining the team. Obari redesigned Ixer Robo, giving it a look more in line with heroic super robots. The robots in Part 1 had a very tokusatsu feel to them, and their movements really felt like someone wearing a costume, but Obari would bring the mechs to life by animating them as if they were muscular superheroes. 
By the time Act 2 released, Toronto had had enough of television, not just due to the issues on Toby Kage, but a culmination of the turbulence he experienced on Megazone, Macross, Ikkyu-san, and all the projects he proposed only for them to be rejected. During an interview with anime and tokusatsu journalist Noriaki Ikeda, Ikeda would ask Hirano about the possibility of a TV series expanding the story of Ixer-1. To which Hirano replied, It's true that robot animation TV series are appealing, but I don't think it's possible to make something satisfactory with the situation and budget presented. It will inevitably end up as a compromised video. Going on to explain that he felt the industry's goal was to make anime on as low a budget as possible to maximize returns. Act 2 ended on a cliffhanger as Hirano knew once a second OVA was greenlit, he wanted to make the series a trilogy. Act 3 released in March of 87, successfully completing the trilogy, much to Hirano's shock and surprise. Back in 1986, with the OVA boom in full swing and riding off the success of the first installment of Fight Xer One, Hirano would team up with Masami Obari and mech designer Koichi Ohada to create an OVA remake of 1972's Mazinger. Referred to as Die Mazinger, very little was ever released about this project, and we know why that is. Despite receiving permission to use the Mazinger IP from Dynamic Pro, Toei would step in, asserting their dominance over the anime rights to Mazinger. With Toei unwilling to work with the team, the project was completely reworked into an original OVA, Daimaju Gekito Hagane no Oni, or Steel Devils. At the same time, Hirano would take ideas and characters planned for the Mazinger remake and rework them into his own super robot show, Hyper Combat Unit Dan Gaio. Hirano called his time working on Dan Gaio a time of stability, and he intended the series to run for 6 to 12 OVA episodes. The series followed a group of psychics who joined forces to form the super robot Dan Gaio, as they fight against the evil forces of Captain Gary Moss and his henchman Gil Berg. Despite starting off as a Mazinger project, the series would draw more comparisons to Fight Ixer 1. However, the Mazinger influence can still be seen in aspects like the character Pi Thunder, whose dark skin and tomboyish personality are most likely transplanted from great Mazinger's Jun Hono. Hono means fire in Japanese, so that's probably why Pai's last name is Thunder. Dan Gaio would also utilize Mazinger's iconic attack, the Rocket Punch. Perhaps because it was a mishmash of ideas, by Episode 2, the series was being criticized for its lack of focus and a boring main character. For Episode 3, Hirano took a more hands-on approach and actually did key animation after years of exclusively directing. His hope was to reorganize the story for Episode 3 and give a completely new impression for Part 4. Part 4 would never come, though, and lackluster sales on Part 3 would end Dan Gaio prematurely. Something that's important to point out is that I haven't been covering every show Hirano worked on, but rather focusing on the ones that are historically significant, or the ones that Hirano specifically talked about how they affected him or his career. For example, in 1980, Hirano and Kugawa both worked on Osamu Tezuka's Phoenix 2772, and in 1983, Hirano did animation directing on episode 28 of Plares Sanchiro. But I never mentioned those because Hirano never did, or when he did, it was just in passing and didn't provide any substantial insight. That being said, Hirano's work on the 1988 OVA Dragon's Heaven also falls into that category. Hirano designed the main character for the film, but anyone who watches the film will tell you that what makes it stand out are actually its mechanical designs and backgrounds. The film has an aesthetic that feels like Mobius meets the Five Star Stories, and though Hirano's work isn't bad at all, the work of director Makoto Kobayashi really steals the show. Speaking of less than relevant titles, there's also Iron Spurk. Iron Spurk wasn't even a fully realized anime, but a proposal Hirano put together to show to Studio Sunrise. The show would have been about young warriors who battle with armor that unequips to form chess pieces. For context, Sunrise was looking for a show to compete with Toei Saint Seiya, and although Iron Spurk would be rejected, Hirano would say that he was very passionate about the project, a lot more than he was with a lot of other rejected proposals. Hirano even said that he was ready to give up working on straight-to-video anime and go back to television if the series was greenlit. But unfortunately, that wouldn't be the case, and Sunrise would instead move forward with the production of Samurai Troopers, known in the West as Ronin Warriors, to fill that role. In that same year of 1988, Hirano and his wife would co-create a new OVA series, Vampire Princess Miyu. The series was animated by Soei Shinsha, the company that animated the Cream Lemon Hentai series, who were looking to branch out into the general public. Vampire Princess Miyu was about a vampire girl named Miyu who must seal away Shinma, demon gods possessing humans on Earth. The series combined elements of Western vampire folklore and Japanese traditionalism, and was very popular, especially with high school girls, launching a multimedia franchise that is still going to this day. 1988 was a pretty busy year for Hirano as he would also direct Hades Project Zeo Rhymer, a four-episode mech OVA based on a manga by Yoshiki Takia. Like Ixer 1, the original manga was published in Lemon People, but the sexually explicit material was toned down in the anime, and the OVA was decently successful. 
though the series would never see the success of Takia's later manga. Near the turn of the decade, AIC and Polydor had teamed up to create an Ixer drama CD called Ixer 3, and the popularity of this drama CD led to AIC reaching out to Hirano about adapting Ixer 3 into an anime. Hirano was reluctant at first, but eventually accepted the offer, and production began in early 1990, spawning a six-episode OVA series, Adventure Ixer 3. Ixer 3 introduced a new Ixer, the childlike Ixer 3, voiced by Japanese pro wrestler Kyuji Suzuki. Ixer 3 was a huge departure from Ixer 1, with a much softer art style and drastically toned down in terms of violence and nudity. Hirano said that he was only given eight months to produce all six episodes, and a large amount of time was spent in the recording booth with Cutie Suzuki, who struggled with the lip-syncing process required in dubbing anime. The brief production time led to Hirano having to work recklessly, and he wasn't satisfied with the finished product. After Ixer 3, Hirano said he wanted to take a step back from directing to recharge his batteries, and urged fans to remember that Ixer 3 was made under completely different conditions than Ixer 1, and that he hopes viewers don't compare the two in the same perspective. While Hirano was taking a break from directing, mostly focusing on manga and illustration, the Japanese bubble economy burst. Huge budget straight-to-video anime were becoming more and more scarce, and it was becoming apparent that if Hirano wanted to continue working in anime, doing work for television was a necessity. When Hirano did return, he'd still work on OVAs here and there, but these would never have the same cultural impact of Megazone 23 or Ixer 1. One of these projects would include another sequel to Ixer, Ixer Girls Exalien. Exalien was about a team of girls, including a descendant of the original Ixer 1's Nagisa, who merged with alien robots that become power armor to fight other aliens. This OVA leaned more into the tone of Ixer 3, retaining the pro wrestling motif, and including power armor that may have been Hirano's way of realizing his ideas from Iron Spurk. Exalien would be the worst received Ixer series and ended after two episodes, both released in early 1995. That same year though, Hirano would return to television in a huge way. <laughs> Magic Knight Rayearth was about three girls who were transported into the fantasy world Sephiro, where they're tasked with protecting it using elemental magic powers and rune gods who take the form of giant robots. From a brief summary, Rayearth and Hirano seem like a perfect match, with it being a female-focused mecha anime. But honestly, Rayearth is much more of a shoujo action series, having been based on a clamp manga, the same group responsible for Cardcaptor Sakura. Regardless, Hirano's work on the first season was well received, and this was important because although he had spent years in the industry and had directed OVAs, as well as done animation directing on episodes of shows, this was his first time as a chief director in charge of an entire TV program, and Hirano would call season one of Rayearth a learning experience. Because of the positive reception, Hirano was kept on as director for season two. However, the manga for what would become season two hadn't been completed, and clamp writer Nanase Okawa didn't want the anime to spoil the story. As a result, Hirano was encouraged to take liberties, and he did so by emphasizing Hikaru as the main character and adding anime-exclusive villains like Nova and Lady Debonair. Some speculate Nova was actually inspired by Ixer 2, while hardcore conspiracy theorists take it a step further and believe Hirano's story elements were originally ideas he had for a fourth, never-realized Ixer OVA. Season 2 of Magic Knight Rayearth was way more divisive, with many fans disliking his interpretation of Hikaru, as well as his reworking of the manga's lore. The same year Hirano would direct Season 2 of Rayearth, he'd also direct the OVA Apocalypse Zero, a violent and stylized action OVA. Unfortunately, after Apocalypse Zero and Rayearth Season 2, you'll see the credits on Hirano's filmography become less and less exciting. There are a few exceptions, Vampire Princess Miyu got a TV series in 97, and it ran for 26 episodes, as well as getting multiple spin-off manga. Dangayo even got a continuation in 2001 in the form of the TV series Great Dangayo, a 26-episode TV series continuing the story from the OVA, whose early episodes did so poorly it became a 13-episode TV series continuing the story of the OVA. And Hirano would tell fans to never expect another installment in Dangayo, claiming the series was cursed. After that, most of Hirano's filmography is pretty standard industry work, mostly doing storyboards and animation for TMS shows like Sonic X, Detective Conan, the occasional Lupin special, while also sometimes slipping into the director's chair on projects like Devilman Lady. For nearly a decade, it seemed as if Hirano was stuck working as an industry jobber, which is a shame considering the impact he had in the 70s and 80s. But then... In 2018, Hirano directed the Netflix adaptation of the manga Baki the Grappler. This adaptation was met with generally positive reception, and Hirano would direct the two follow-up series released in 2020 and 2021. 
What makes Baki stand out is that it wasn't an anime made for TV, but an ONA, or original net animation. To an extent, ONAs are the modern equivalent of an OVA. The budgets aren't as high, but ONAs aren't bound by television standards, and don't have to stretch their stories out to hit a predetermined episode count. Because of this, we've seen a lot of groundbreaking animation in the last few years, and even as someone who isn't a fan of Western animation, I love the Netflix adaptation of Castlevania and have only heard good things about League of Legends Arcane. With net animation being so successful and offering a level of freedom that Hirano always sought, I hope that maybe in the near future we see at least one more original animation project from the man who made 80s anime. 80s?